Hey guys, I'm Justin with Legato Financial Group. Our firm is passionate about helping educate consumers, which is why we're powering the Gaining Interest Podcast, the podcast of quick conversations with industry experts on topics that you want to know about, from sports to dining to healthcare and automotive, and really everything in between. It's hosted by one of the greatest local personalities that I've met, that's John Ramsey. I'll tell you why I love this podcast, because it's all about community. We used to call it water cooler talk, and that no longer exists. But if it's interesting to you, it's interesting to us. We encourage you to tell your friends. As Justin mentioned, we're going to talk about everything under the sun. We will be gaining interest, and we appreciate you watching. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Gaining Interest. This is a show that is all about anything interesting, and we are powered by Legato Financial Group. We are so proud to be here with you today and talk about something that we're all interested in, and that's living a long, vibrant, and abundant life. So we're going to talk about your health today with two experts. With me now is nurse practitioner Charlene Sanders. Charlene, welcome to the show. Thank you. And cardiologist Dr. Bart Dawson. Dr. Dawson, welcome to the show. Pleasure, thank you. Okay, this will be fun. You guys are, I can already tell, and as you can tell as you're watching this, you pass the eyeball test, okay? <laughs> you look like really intelligent people. Thank you. But let, let's make sure that we know, hey, they've got the credibility here. So tell me a little bit about your backgrounds. First of all, you, Charlene, tell me about your education and, and where you're working now. So I'm a nurse practitioner. I have a master's degree in nursing science. I started as a registered nurse and I worked for, I worked as a registered nurse for 11 years at the bedside in the ICU. And uh, then I went back for my master's degree. And as soon as I graduated, I started working with Baptist Cardiology and I've been there since. Okay, why the upgrade from being a registered nurse to a nurse practitioner? What, what was the allure for you? Just to do more, to be able to accomplish more? I felt like I could help people more and be more autonomous and be a bigger part of their, um, of their health and wellness, nurse practitioner. Dr. Dawson. Okay, background if you would please. Well, I'm a farm boy from Shepherdsville, right. Kentucky, but I, uh, Got interested in cardiology and in medicine in general in high school and uh, went to U of L for uh, medical school and, and residency in UK for cardiology. And I've been in for 15 years now and I'm in Elizabethtown with Baptist Health. Yeah, I, I love talking to medical experts because I find that, you know, it's ever changing. There's always new technology and you guys are going to get us up to date on state of the art and maybe some things that folks can do at home. Uh, I'm going to, believe me, I'm going to pick your brain here and have some fun with it at the same time. So first of all, as far as diagnosing and treating cardiovascular disease, Charlene, I'll ask you, okay, are there some basics or things that you're finding that are changing very rapidly? Uh, are we becoming a more healthy population? Uh, I don't think so, especially in this part of the country. Um, we just with the socioeconomic population, we're not, we're not really there yet, but we, um, in cardiology, we're advancing rapidly and we're able to um, run tests and um, lab work on people and really get an idea of their risk going forward, whereas a few years ago, we didn't have a lot of these options. Yeah, Dr. Dawson, uh, no, you're a cardiologist. You perform surgery as well. Not necessarily surgery. So cardiac surgeons are different type of doctor than cardiologists. They go through different training, kind of from the end of medical school, they join a surgical program. Okay. Whereas cardiologists go through medical, like internal medicine, and, and then subspecialize into cardiology from there. The most surgery I do is putting in a defibrillator or pacemaker in a patient. Oh. Uh, but the open heart procedures are for the surgeons, and um, they, uh, they spend a lot of time in school and in the OR learning how to do that. So. So when we say cardiovascular, you know, I'm, I'm a novice, and if I come off as too elementary, uh, yeah. just please bear with me here, but heart and lungs. So that's basically what we're talking about here. There seems to be, or is it just the perception because we're watching TV, there seems to be a healthy trend going on in terms of diet and people trying to live longer. Charlene, do you find that to be true or are habits trending in the, in the other direction? You seem to th say already. No, I yeah. do, yeah. yeah. I think people are taking it more seriously, taking their health more seriously, especially the younger generation that's coming up. They seem to have a bigger interest in you know, what they're putting in their bodies and how they're treating their bodies. And you know, they, wanna, they wanna make a difference and kind of get it right going forward. Um, and, and they see the technology that we have available to us. And so they, they kind of have high expectations of what we can do as far as diagnosis and, and things like that. Dr. Dawson, I'm, I'm curious. I was watching the show and it was, it was really interesting. And it was about, and you may have seen it, it was about centurions, people who live 100 years or more. Mm -hmm. And they had certain niches around the globe where people tended to live longer. And the things they found 
that I thought were interesting that were commonalities between the groups was like, for one, usually they were involved in some kind of physical exercise, farming or something yeah. like that. There was another one that was a, a community in Greece where the, the landscape was very hilly. So they had to walk a lot of hills and up and down and that helped keep them in shape. There was another one where, believe it or not, they, they ate sourdough bread. And that was something that kept them, you know, they thought because of the yeast and the uh, probiotics and all that. Anyway, bottom line was, I thought it was interesting. Can you, if you had to say, hey, this, I attribute this person living this long or having longevity, is it genetics or is it lifestyle? Uh, I think probably yes to both. Um, and so in certain areas of the world, we know that there's genetic uh, things that protect certain populations, um, whether it's their cholesterol profile um, or their risk of r other risk factors like diabetes and high blood pressure. But then you can also study other, other populations that eat a certain way and it seems to be somewhat protective. It's always a hard thing to, to take population observations and then boil them down to one person. So if, if somebody's in my office and I say, what's your, what's your secret to live into 100? Um, I wouldn't know that any, any more than them. But it's probably a combination of lifestyle, certainly. You very rarely ever meet a 100-year-old person who's smoked um, because most of them are, are gone from either lung disease or cancer or heart disease before then. Very rarely do you meet a 100-year-old that's diabetic or, and has been for a long time. So usually it's that their risk factors, they, they escaped major risk factors or major lifestyle problems that, that resulted in, in excess risk of cardiac disease. But the genetics of it, yeah, it's a tough equation because there's so many things that go into heart disease. It's not a one-gene disease. So it's hard to even answer the question, what genetically is the reason for this person being so, uh, so old? So Charlene, I'm always confused about because sometimes we are, I think we're a little jaded because we see so much propaganda. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm always told, hey, university-based studies, uh, double blind, placebo, this kind of thing to make sure that, it, and, and no, someone who has no skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So because I've, like for instance, I've heard, okay, it's okay to have a couple of drinks a day. Uh, alcohol isn't totally bad for you. What, what would be your recommendation on some of the generalities that we hear? So I, that's tough, you know. I, I tend to tell people everything in moderation, you know. Um, if, you're, if you're drinking a couple of, you know, alcoholic beverages a day, are you also exercising regularly? Are you also eating fruits and vegetables and, you know, white meats and, and eating healthy and taking care of yourself other ways? Or are you drinking all day and smoking all day? Then you're going to have, you know, higher risk factors and things like that. So if, if you know, you're going to have a couple drinks a day, the, the rest of your lifestyle kind of wants to make up for that. Okay. And, and maybe I'm leaning on this a little bit because I, I want to hear your answer, but I think it's, it's interesting in that sometimes even fitness fanatics can have cardiovascular issues. For instance, we, you probably remember, or maybe even in med school talked about Jim Fix, wrote the book, The Joy of Running, and he kind of brought the running craze to America. And right. I thought it was interesting, died of a heart attack while he was running. Yes. So was that a genetic factor or was he overdoing it? What's your opinion, doctor? So we, we have patients all the time that fall way out of the, the spectrum uh, on either end. We have people that look like the epitome of health that have horrible vascular disease and other people that are your classic walking heart attack that have clean arteries. So it, it is very difficult, like I said, to, to take one person and tell them, well, this is the reason why you aren't going to have heart disease, because um, sometimes you're wrong. Um, we, we had a, an, an Ironman triathlete die of a heart attack uh, here locally within the past 10 years, um, who's a fitness machine. So again, it's those things that we haven't, haven't worked out yet in cardiology genetically, why do, what are the combination of things that lead to somebody getting, um, getting vascular disease that has nothing else on paper that would have pointed to that? Um, and, and it's not just true in cardiovascular, it's true with cancer, dementia, um, even di diabetes sometimes. You don't really know why somebody, somebody gets these conditions. Um, but still, it's protective to some degree. You don't yes. meet a lot of people that are very fit that, that really have horrible heart disease, at least not in, in their younger years, it affects a lot of people as we get older. Just, just you generally. can help your chances. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That, well, but let's there's talk about. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. When we opened up, we talked about, we touched upon technology and the improvements, and I want to get to that. But first of all, let's talk about some general general recommendations from you, Charlene. You know, we hear a lot about diet, and I'm sure that's true. But maybe go a little bit deeper on things, little things that people can do every day. They're watching. They're saying, are there? Is there something I can do to help out my cardiovascular condition? Yeah, so I think the number one thing is to be active and to have an active lifestyle and not, you know, be sedentary. So participate in some, some form of exercise 
you know, three to five days a week is the, the number one thing that you can do for your, your heart health. Um, beyond that, obviously a healthy diet, eating lots of fruits and vegetables and grains and nuts and avoiding, um, you know, a lot of sugar and, uh, and fatty foods is, is really the second best thing that you can do for yourself. But I think maintaining a healthy lifestyle and kind of com combining all those things is the best thing you can do to prevent cardiovascular disease. You know, sometimes people, due to their occupation, they don't have choices. So Dr. Dawson, I have to ask you, I have heard this, maybe it's an exaggeration or maybe you'll tell me, yes, I confirm that. I've heard that sitting at a desk all day in front of a computer screen is the new smoking. That sitting that long that your organs aren't meant to sit and relax for hours at a time. Your thoughts? I think, I think it is depending on what you do with the other 16 hours of the day. Um, so if, if your nutrition is on point where you're, you're not carrying around a ton of extra weight um, and you're active outside of work where you're trying to take care of yourself, keep yourself in, in pretty good shape and, and being intentional about it, like making it an appointment for yourself to, to get some exercise. Um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of people who are sedentary at work, unfortunately they're sedentary at home and they're, they're watching TV at home, they're, they're not staying active or, or having hobbies that really keep them or challenge them to give themselves a stress test, you know, two or three days a week. Um, so I think it's what you do outside of, of work. Now, there's also just bodily um, difficulties with sitting for that long a day. So you want to get up and move around, you know, while you're at work as well to the, to, to the extent you can. Um, but I, I think keeping, keeping track of what you're doing outside of a relatively sedentary job is, is as important as how harmful that job is to you. But unfortunately, most people, they're sedentary at work. Um, you know, in our population, we, we see people in clinic every day that are, they just, they're not active. And it doesn't matter whether it's their job or, or at home, they just don't, don't take the time to, to stick with it. And that's something you really should try to start as young as possible. Right, right, yeah. Well, you talk about, you know, the benefits from leading an active lifestyle, but something I've heard about, and Charlene, maybe you can help me and clarify or talk a little bit about, I've heard, you know, sleep. The importance of sleep on your cardiovascular health or on your health in general. The relationship, is there a relationship? Sure, you know, um, getting a healthy rest at night is gonna give you fuel for the day, right? Fuel for the activities that you should be doing throughout the day and the exercise that you should participate in. Um, not getting a healthy amount of sleep, you're gonna feel crummy and you're gonna wanna sit around all day and take naps and things like that. So, you know, just, it jump starts your day, it puts you in a, a frame of mind for the day to, to continue feeling good throughout the day with whatever activities you're participating in. So I think it's, indirectly and directly going to affect your your health. We hope that no one, that, that if you're watching now, that everyone in your family is healthy, no heart or cardiovascular issues. But with that being said, if that happens, the news isn't always, isn't all bad. Let's talk a little bit about technologies that are available that perhaps weren't available 10 years ago. Dr. Dawson, what have you seen? What, what have you seen that go, this made a major impact? This helped people, many of my patients have been helped. Well, one of the things that, that we've, we've known for years is that plaque, um, you know, when plaque starts to develop in our arteries, um, it's not just an older age thing. You know, there, there's been studies that have been done more than 70 years ago in post-war um, uh, autopsy studies that show plaque in the, in the arteries, early plaque in the arteries of young soldiers. Um, so this, this is a, a pathology that starts when we're much younger. Well, modern times, uh, we have a, ways of imaging the heart uh, to where we can actually detect early plaque and, and not necessarily remove it or get it to go away. We've never unlocked how to do that, but knowing that uh, early on gives us an opportunity to do things to prevent uh, the progression of plaque that you may have missed or that you wouldn't have told the patient. And it also gives the patient a little bit more of an impetus to do it. Um, uh, we, we always are um, you know, trying to row the boat as straight as possible once you find out there's something wrong. Um, so to, to know information early on, um, it, it helps patients get a little bit more motivated uh, to, to kind of take care of risk factors that maybe they've ignored, try to live a healthier life, and perhaps go on preventative therapies that they may not have really been offered until 10 years from then. Um, so there, there's a, a type of CAT scan that can be done called a, a calcium score. So you've heard of the term hardening of the arteries. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our plaque in our vessels actually has little speckles of calcium in it. CAT scanning, there's a certain type of CAT scan that, that can process and count really how much calcium is developing in our arteries. Ideally, that's zero, um, but it, it gives you a score, like how, how much calcium is in my coronaries. 
and it can that that number can vary anywhere from zero to several thousand. Is that genetic, or is it due to diet, or both? Well, it doesn't matter what it's due to; it's just there. So it, it's a test that detects the presence of early plaque, uh, or or even severe plaque in our arteries. It doesn't tell us how bad it is, but it gives us kind of an overall burden of how much plaque's really there, um, uh, using that that calcium, you know, quantifying cal calcium in the arteries. Um, so I, I find that useful, not necessarily to tell the patient you have a perfectly clean bill of health or you're a mess inside, but it does help us kind of point, point our therapies to the people that are really at higher risk. Um, it also identifies some people that don't have any evidence at that point of plaque and they may not derive any benefit from medication for prevention and shouldn't be on it. And inspire those who do have an issue. It's like, okay, like, I, it's I, I have to do. solid evidence. You got, you have to do something. Correct. Yes. And, and I, I find that useful. The, the, the studies don't show that every single person needs to have a calcium score, certainly. But when I sit down with that person who's 45 and they tell me, Doc, you know, I've got three uncles, my dad and my brother all had, you know, a heart problem by the time they were 50, 55 years old. And they're, they're saying, what about me? Well, I don't know genetically whether you're going to have the same fate as your family members, but what I can do is is get a test that looks and, and sees is, is there signs that you're developing. So now. do you recommend that, taking that case that you just mentioned, if with, there is history? With family history, I do, because if you look currently at the guidelines, you take one person out of the lineup and, and you calculate their estimated cardiac risk, and there's easy tools online to do that. Sometimes they'll calculate very low risk, but their family would suggest they're not low risk. And the family history is not necessarily baked into that calculated risk. So for those patients that, that I still feel like, you know, we need a double check on this. Um, you're not high risk on paper. Let's do this scan. If your calcium score is very low or zero, then I think for at least the three to five year period that we're dealing with now, uh, we don't need to really look into anything else. We'll revisit this kind of as time goes on. Um, I do think it's useful in those patients because you don't know what to tell them otherwise. On paper, you, you don't look high risk. So if there's another tool that we can use to try to try to maybe uh, get us off the fence one way or the other, aggressive prevention or watch and wait, then I, I, that's the patients I another use that. Another tool in the toolbox. Quite a bit, yeah, oh, I use it. All right. Okay, speaking of other tools in the toolbox, regardless of industry, AI is changing the way the world operates. I would assume in the medical field, it's humongous, it's huge, and I'm sure right now you're all, we're kind of figuring out it's the Wild West, how will it apply to medical issues? So I want you both to weigh in. Charlene, uh, AI, are you using it currently, and, and what do you see as the future as far as medical and artificial intelligence? Well, that's a tough question as far as the future goes, um, because I'm not I'm not well versed in the topic of AI. But I do I was using it for a little while. You remember I talked to you about mm -hmm. it. Um, we it, there's an there's an app for dictation for us to dictate our notes in the clinic, and um, and it's an AI app, and it just basically listens to your conversation. You know, you let the patient know, hey, I've got I've got my dictator uh, in my pocket. It's going to listen to our conversation and translate it into the note for me, and then it does exactly that. It listens to just your general conversation you know you don't you weren't I wasn't telling it hey put in hyperlipidemia or make document hyperlipidemia um, I would talk to the patient and say hey your cholesterol is high we're gonna put you on a cholesterol medication and it would translate it into the note and say patient has hyperlipidemia is going to be started on this medication at this dose uh, we'll recheck a cholesterol panel in three months you know just based on the conversation that I had in the room with the patient so it was fascinating and it was a really um, it was a really helpful app um, and it did a really good job. I always joked because it made my note sound so much better than, than <laughs> I sounded when I did my own note. So, um, so it, was, it was cool and it was really easy to get at our fingertips just with a little app. So it's amazing what, it, what it's already doing. And it could even um, you know, translate from other languages into English and things like that. So it's fascinating. What, what, do you, what do you see in Doc? I think uh, the, the, the leap forward over, you know, I started in cardiology 15 years ago. We had paper charts, you know, you were still keeping track of actual stapled together reports and the binder for the patient's record. So as we've moved all into electronic health records, in, and there's still a ways to go in there, especially with different systems talking to each other, but with the medical record all being electronic and digitized now, um, AI is able to help us kind of flag like complex features of a patient's case together and kind of remind their doctor, hey, you might want to look at this or medication interactions, 
um, different disease states. And, it's almost and like another opinion, right? It is, and, and it, uh, it's really just based on kind of the, the known statistics about different disease uh, states and how they interact um, and what, what it might put a patient at risk for that you may not be thinking of. Um, so if five, six different doctors put various data into the patient's chart, and I'm sitting there um, you know, looking at their cholesterol panel, the system might remind me, hey, look, this patient is, is, looks like they're high risk for cardiovascular disease. You might want to put them on this medication if it's appropriate. Um, it at least makes you think you know, and double check uh, at times because we're, we're all busy and you see patients for a variety of different things. You might not necessarily on that visit, if you're their primary care doctor or me, be thinking about that particular issue. So the, the electronic health record and you know, AI and integrating all that data in all of our busy, busy days, sometimes it does help you, uh, you Interesting. Know, kind of get reminded to, to watch this for a patient. Yeah. And, and technology, when you, when you are able to, I mean, you look at these smart watches, I noticed you have one on. I mean, it, it, it started with you know, heart rate and then sleep patterns, and now I understand it can take your temperature and it's like it can be used as a stethoscope, all of these different things. Does this help your patients become, do you find it helps them become more proactive or more conscientious and maybe watch themselves a little bit? Charlene, what are you seeing? What are, what's the feedback you're getting from these? So I get a lot of feedback, actually. A lot of times I'll get a referral for a patient that had uh, sustained tachycardia on their Apple Watch and they want to be checked out by a cardiologist. So um, people are definitely paying attention to what their devices are telling them and they're interested to know more, probably more so than without the device. You know, they're, they're saying, why does my heart rate run so high all the time? Or why is it low when I'm sleeping? And, and they're asking good questions about it, you know. Um, I've also seen it, um, I've also seen it, you know, re recommend that somebody see a physician because it detected something like an arrhythmia on their smartwatch. And I've seen them come in and then we in turn, you know, put a monitor on them and end up diagnosing that same arrhythmia. So it, it's detected true arrhythmias in some of our patients. Um, so I, I'm a fan of them and I think, um, I think, you know, more knowledge is power for our patients. So sure. You find that to be true? I think it, it, it's helped. It's helped. It's not perfect. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of times where there's false positives um, where a patient turns out to be fine. And I, but I think it's a, it's a better flag than we've ever had before to identify. It helps with the history too. So if a patient comes in and, and they otherwise you know, uh, would have complained of just fluttering or palpitations, and it's hard to really kind of pin down what's going on. Uh, but if they say, well, my Apple Watch told me at that moment my heart rate was 180, well, that's not normal for you to be sitting and all of a sudden your heart rate's 180. That's more than just, I'm a little bit anxious, so, you know, let's look into this. And, you know, it helps, it helps you to separate sometimes, this definitely is yeah, not normal versus real. this is something that I yeah. think we can reassure is probably okay for you. Um, so I, I do use it. That there has been studies done on the accuracy of especially the Apple Watch, not a ton of data but it correlates correctly with, with your heart rhythm to the extent it can about 80% of the time. Wow. So it's not bad when it comes down to, to detecting you know, uh, usable data. Mm. If for no other reason, yeah. makes us all more aware. Right. Yeah, interesting story, my, my son was in a car wreck, and interesting because knock on wood, he was fine, but I mean, his car literally flipped on the highway due to, and, wow. and, and because he had his Apple Watch on, and not only did it alert, wow, wow your heart, heart rate, rate just went out. You know, he was scared, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And it also called the EMS yeah. instantly. Wow, I mean, that is life-saving, literally. Yeah, and it says, crazy. like, we've detected you were in a car accident, we'll call 911 for you. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. I mean, it, but it's, it's good, good crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, diet. I, I know we are, uh, every day, we are bombarded with this diet, that diet, keto diet, Mediterranean diet. What do you recommend to your patients? What do you recommend? Uh, you know, like I said before, I tell them everything in moderation. People will always ask me, can I eat cake? Can I have cookies? You know, do I need to stop eating bacon? Um, questions like that. And I, I tell them, you know, it's, you don't have to stop completely. You can have some bacon, but, you know, you balance it out with a healthy fruit, a plate in the morning, or a plate of vegetables or fruits in the morning. And then uh, throughout the day, you just want to you just want to maintain balance and try to have more good things than bad things in your diet. So lots of, like I said before, fruits, vegetables, healthy grains, nuts, um, chicken, fish, those sort of things. Um, you want to maintain on average throughout the day, and then a healthy treat every now and then is not going to hurt you. Yeah. 
So I think one of the reasons why it's so frustrating to, as you said, be bombarded with so much nutrition information is because there is surprisingly little conclusive evidence out there regarding any one particular type of eating with a direct impact on cardiovascular events. Less than you would think based on how much we're bombarded mm -hmm. with you should eat this way, that way. So Mediterranean um, diet, No, there is, there is data. So currently the best studies on nutrition and, and again, we're observing, you have to point out the difference between she and I are seeing patients with cardiac pathology every day. If we're talking about how you would eat for your lifestyle, for your lifespan, that would reduce nice. your risk lifetime of having cardiovascular disease, that's a totally separate discussion than the patient that's six weeks post-op from their heart attack coming back and asking me, how should I eat now? Okay. You know, to some extent, I tell patients, the horse is out of the barn, you have heart disease, not that you should eat whatever you want, but this is not a discussion necessarily that I'm, I'm going to reverse your heart disease right now at 68 years old because you just had a heart attack. But if we're talking about long-term data, there's, there's pretty good data on the Mediterranean-style diet, as you mentioned, in terms of protective uh, its protective effect on cardiovascular events. Olive oil things. And, and we think that it's probably due because the sources of good fat in that diet uh, come from olive oil, legumes, beans, nuts. Avocados. They don't eat, yeah, they don't eat as much red meat, um, a lot of fish, white meat. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's been studied and I think been studied relatively well where it appears that if you were going to sign up for a nutritional lifestyle early on, that would be the one to sign up for. Um, now, again, if I tell the 68-year-old post-heart attack patient, you need, you need to today start eating the Mediterranean diet, I can't really look them straight face and tell them I know for sure that this is going to change the course of your heart disease. But the amount of cardiovascular events, when you try to control as best you can for other features in a population, seems to be lower with that over a person's life. So again, lifespan. increase your chances, right? Right, yeah. start early. You know, yeah. you, you wanna do what you can, as young as you can, to prevent what's gonna happen 30, 40 years from now, um, um, rather than you know, when you're 70 and you're sitting down talking to me in the office about how blocked your artery is. Um, yes, you should take some measures to improve your Get lifestyle anyway, but it definitely would be much more of a benefit if you did it in your 30s rather than later in life. But the Mediterranean diet, there's good data for that. And I think it's it, the fat sources. Also, they, they uh, have a moderate, uh, the Mediterranean populations have a moderate intake of wine, which we think is somewhat protective. It's, we're, we backed off a little bit about saying you should drink one glass of red wine a day, which you might remember 20 years ago, right. that was actually being told to patients. Um, and then there's other things too. Most, most people used to think that it's the Mediterranean lifestyle, right? Just less stressful, you know, you're getting plenty of sun, you're moderate wine drinking, like social, happy, laid back. And I think there's some, something to that as well. Um, but I think from the nutrition standpoint, I think it's a source of fat um, and, and not, as, not as much obesity, and not, not as much calorie intake daily. All those things matter. But that, that's where I would come down on it if I was talking to a young person that, you know, Mediterranean style nutrition probably common sense advice yeah, yeah and like you said there is some research to back it yeah so but it's not going to help you if you're already in trouble yeah it's not going to not going to reverse heart disease right, we've never go. never been able to figure that out but you know when we deal with our populations here um you're not going to have ever ever kentuckian say oh yeah i'm gonna start eating the mediterranean diet um, so I focus mostly nutritionally with my patients and again i have a filter in my office where i'm seeing pathology Right. I see a lot of healthy patients, but we're also dealing with patients that have horrible heart disease. So moderation, calorie restriction, so that you get down to a relatively normal body weight, that is absolutely first and foremost. There you go. Whether that's done by the Mediterranean diet, I'm not a real big fan of keto because I just don't think it's tenable long term for most patients. But I go through step by step, this is the calorie target I want you to hit, this is the deficit I want you to have every day. Um, this is how I want you to count and me measure your food. This is the app I want you to put on your phone to count all that. I do go through that with patients when that's the discussion, you know, for that visit. Because if there's no other goal you have nutritionally, it should be do whatever you can to try to get your BMI down, you know, toward 25 or so or below. And that's going to pay dividends long term, whether it's high blood pressure, so. whether it's risk of sleep apnea, your bones and joints are going to last longer. Um, the risk of diabetes is going to go down. 
just because you've lost lost the extra extra weight. Solid advice. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to differentiate between real medicine and maybe some kind of hype or a sell to get people. I have seen all of these boutique medical uh, entities, and maybe it's holistic or it's technology, and they claim they can go deeper than you're a, a general practitioner or a cardiologist, a blood test and find out exactly what you can eat and can't eat. And they will elongate your life and you'll feel so much better, at, but very expensive. Yeah. They're like boutique medical facilities. You know what I'm talking about. I don't want to mention names here, but we've all seen them and it's very attractive. Uh, if, you, if you're reading this, you're going, wow, this sounds good. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think not, not that everything that they would offer you is, is not helpful, because th they would do some of the normal things that we've talked about so far uh, to assess risk. But there are a lot of things in medicine, especially technology, newer things that we can do, but we don't know what to do with the answer. Um, they're very expensive. And uh, a lot of these places, it, it's a pretty penny to try to get these, these very detailed assessments of, of your risk, whether it's cardiovascular disease or otherwise. So I would, I would definitely caution that a lot of the, a lot of the things that, that these places do uh, beyond the basic things we've, we've discussed, um, we may not have data that shows, okay, you can measure that, but if you do this in response to that measurement, then you get this outcome. We don't have that answer yet. Um, so ultimately, medicine costs money. Practicing medicine prevention costs money. So when you have uh, an insurance company that's trying to decide what are the things that we will cover, they look at data too. Is this beneficial? Has this been proven to be standard of care or something that is probably beneficial to the patient? So if you have the, these battery of tests and eight out of 10 of them, there's no data that shows that they're beneficial, but they're very expensive. Um, most of the time we would caution against doing those tests until we really know that there's randomized studies that show if you use this marker as a, um, as a uh, pointer for doing something different to your patient, then you definitely reduce their outcome of heart attack or early death or something like that. Um, then we would put them into practice. But before then, they're not really recommended or there's no level of evidence that suggests that those should be done in a wide scale manner. Um, and so insurance companies do that, your d doctors do that when it comes to how we interpret the data. So a lot of these places are doing tests that we really just don't have enough data to answer the question, how do you use it? I see. Um, so, and, they, and it may be proven, you know, eventually that there are, is some benefit uh, of a lot of these battery of tests that they do. But most of the time, the reason why it costs so much is because nobody covers it and they're expensive to do. Um, so it, it's a niche and there's a lot of people that that you know have the money to go do that and swear by it but for the general population i just don't think that it's that helpful yet so charlene proceed at your own risk correct? i think so yeah so obviously there's a difference in the genders male female when it comes to cardiovascular disease or maybe symptoms or signs we should look for is there any difference between a male and a female charlene there is actually uh, women women often present different than men when they have heart attack symptoms so you know, a man can typically, you hear about the, the typical chest pain or that radiates to their arm. Um, that really is how they a lot of times will present. But women can have uh, a number of symptoms ranging from abdominal pain, um, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, um, fatigue, uh, back pain a lot of times they'll present with or like between the shoulder blades. So they present differently and, you know, women in general should be aware that you know, aware of what their body's telling them and pay attention to their symptoms um, because they may not present with the typical chest pain. That's a great take home because I did not realize. Yeah. Interesting, very interesting. So, but on the other hand, Dr. Dawson, they could be similar too, right? Oh, th there's definitely cases where they're, they present with the textbook symptoms too. So those, those shouldn't be ignored either. But definitely if symptoms like Charlene was saying that, that kind of fall out of your normal, this is definitely a heart attack type symptoms. If it's severe and it's not going away and it's sudden, it should definitely be kept as a possibility that this, this might be something you know I need to immediately seek medical attention. And if any of those types of symptoms happen in a more stable way, but worse with physical exertion, so if I'm doing something that's more strenuous and I'm getting a wave of nausea or the center of my back's hurting and then it goes away when I rest, 
those are al always red flags. Uh, I, don't, I don't really care what the patient describes, even if it's not the textbook. If it's worse when I exercise and it goes away when I rest, we, we definitely need to look at the heart. So that, gaining that's interest. very important. We yeah. are gaining interest. Powered by Legato Financial Group. And before we go, one more question, okay? Because I, think, I find it interesting when I get medical professionals and I'm allowed to pick your brain, what do you see on the horizon that excites you? Is there something that you see, some, it, whether it be technology, something you have seen, you go, okay, this could be a game changer. This could really change people's lives for the better. Charlene, you first. Hmm, that's a tough one. I think like we talked about before, just the, the general you know, population of young people that are coming up that have more interest in their general health, I think is gonna change the future of healthcare and the way, the way we do things going forward. You, doctor, what do you think, Dr. Dawson? So I, I've, I've kind of been waiting for um, more, more work to be done in, in terms of looking at how do we tell a plaque is going to be one that ruptures and causes a heart attack versus a stable plaque. Now again, this, these are people who already have heart disease, but we know that inside the artery, what causes a heart attack is when the cap on the plaque ruptures and a clot forms right there in, fairly instantly within minutes. Um, in the artery and it stops flow and that's what causes, causes the actual stoppage of the artery. Um, so plaque is a very active lesion and there's been a lot of work done over the years way above my head research wise on what are the, m the microscopic chemicals, the, these, these uh, tiny concentrations of chemicals we can detect in the blood that tell us that a plaque is vulnerable. And it's not something that we, we routinely test for now because there just hasn't been enough data to say it's worth the cost and, and the logistics of doing this, this type of blood testing or swabs or whatever there are, there's different types of tests out there. Um, but to, to find eventually what we need to detect in the bloodstream that's going to say, oh, there's an unstable plaque in that particular patient where we, we boil a test down to one individual to be able to try to do something to protect them more Save um, lives. It is going to be huge because that, that's always been the holy grail of cardiology um, in terms of dealing with coronary disease is why does this person have a heart attack and this person pre presents to me in a stable way. They, they get chest pain, they've got a 90% blockage, but they never have a heart attack or damage their heart. So if we can ever ferret out how to identify the plaque that's going to rupture and cause a heart attack versus the stable patients. I mean, that's where it's at in terms of further reducing mortality, which has come down a lot in the last 60 years, way, way down. Um, but to, to further that and save more lives, that's, that's to me where it's at. I, I would nice love to finish with some optimism that. there. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Charlene Sanders, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dawson, thank you very yeah. much. You know, I, I not only enjoyed the conversation, but I felt comfortable because I knew if I had a heart attack, you got me covered, right? <laughs> if I have a heart attack right here, I'm good? Yeah. Yes. We'll take care of you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, once again, gaining interest, powered by Legato Financial Group. Thank you so much for watching, listening. Stay healthy. We'll see you next time.